<clears throat> in the fourth chapter of Colossians, the apostle Paul begins to conclude his explanation and continues the very precise description and admonition of how as believers we can seek those things which are above and set fix our affections on them our human nature loves to generalize we can just generalize to our heart's content and sadly we are very inclined when we generalize to when we go beyond the generalization we create our own little world we don't we don't follow the specifics of anything so everyone goes in his own generalized direction paul generalized in those two statements but beginning at that point through the third chapter he started very precise and very specific uh, admonitions exhortations and commandments that we live a certain lifestyle he first identified six life functions and gave specifics in each life function as to how we in that function in our lives are commanded to live. In the passage this morning, I hope to cover three out of the four specific behaviors, global and vital behaviors of Christian living, seeking and setting that transcend any life function, any position, any circumstance in life. These are the fundamental building blocks of a Christian life. If we don't practice these, we're not practicing biblical Christianity. The three I hope to cover this morning are persevering prayer, wise walking, and grace talking, and in addition to grace talking, grace living. The fourth category Paul will define in the fourth chapter is the dynamic of gracious, interactive Christianity. You sometimes hear people in this me first world today well, I'm, I'm, I live a Christian life, but it's my business and nobody else's. I'm going to live it my way and I don't have to worry about anyone else. Oh, if you're practicing biblical Christianity and worshiping Jesus, you do have to think about other people. And Paul goes into specific details about gracious interactions with a number of people who have been his aides and helpers in the gospel ministry. We'll save that for the next message, Lord willing. But Let's try to look at these three building blocks as we think this morning. <clears throat> Chapter four, beginning with verse two. Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving, with all praying also for us, that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bonds that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. The word continue in prayer is translated from the same Greek word that Paul used in Ephesians chapter six, verse uh, 18, I believe, where he, after the armor of God, he commands the Ephesians to hold him and other saints up in perseverance in their prayers perseverance and continuing uh, from the same greek word and that word means to continue to do something with intense effort and with or despite difficulty that's the de technical meaning of the word pretty fair de or definition is it not prayer and a lot of other things in the Christian life uh, need to be practiced every day and every act we engage in our lives, not just for a couple of hours on Sunday morning. How do you continue in prayer and drive Southern California freeways? Serve as a flight attendant uh, or whatever you do in your career activities 
and continue in prayer. Those of you who are on Facebook, I would encourage you to look up a, just a very brief paragraph that Elder Mike Ivey wrote just in the last couple of days and posted about this very point. Uh, pray without ceasing, he used in 1 Thessalonians 5. And he made, I believe, the correct point to, to continue in prayer, to persevere in prayer, to pray without ceasing is to live a praying lifestyle. It's to live a life that constantly acknowledges the presence, the reality, and the lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ in our lives. We honor him. We don't carve out our own opinion and our own ways and do it our way when we like and his way when it's convenient. <clears throat> we constantly follow his lifestyle and his way of conduct. The greater part of James chapter four identifies this prayer factor as a lifestyle and both deals with the positive and the negative of when we do practice it or when we don't. <laughs> Spend a little time in that chapter, it will get your attention. So if in fact, continuing in prayer relates to a lifestyle, a couple of questions are obvious. It's just like the, the elephant in the room saying, <clears throat> what conduct, what actions, attitudes, words, or behaviors are conducive to prayer? The opposite. What attitudes, actions, or behaviors shut down prayer? In Psalm 66, verse 8, David wrote, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Now, iniquity can take on two different forms, maybe even more. But iniquity can be our own pursuit of the carnal sins of the flesh. If, if we're pursuing those sins, don't expect to go to the Lord in prayer and get a lot of reaction. I've been writing on answered prayers in my gospel leanings recently. And if, if you belong to the, the fatalistic leaning that says, well, if God answered our prayer, then he would change. No, God doesn't change. He answers prayer because he doesn't change. He's concerned and cares for you as his people. His goodness pervades everything. And that goodness prompts him to answer your prayers. He would be changeable if he didn't respond to your needs when you pray to him. Well, if you're praying to him and don't even believe he answers prayers, don't be shocked if he doesn't answer your prayer. In James 5, James says the prayer of faith will heal the sick. He didn't say the prayer of unbelief would do anything. So put this in personal perspective. You can't pray while you blank in that blank in your life, in your attitudes, words, conduct, action in the last day, the last week, the last month, the last year. You can't pray when you regard iniquity in your heart, right? Okay, iniquity can take on another form. I can mistreat you as a believer. I can talk about you as a believer. I can criticize you and fault find you as a believer. The Lord's not going to hear me when I'm doing that. The Lord despises discord among his people. There are a lot of things we could fill in this blank with, are there not? See, if we look at this commandment as a lifestyle that whenever, whatever circumstance we face, Prayer is encouraged. It will teach us how to live very instructively. My uncle was a pastor for over 50 years before his health broke down and he could no longer continue in his ministry. He told a story. Well, actually, other people who were there told a story. There were some churches or individual people who had become incredibly contentious. They were not only being contentious, they were trying to stir other believers into being contentious. My uncle and some others tried to 
made an appointment, wanted to go sit down with them and try to hear them out and find a way to, to calm their, their moods and make it better. They didn't have much success. During this conversation, my uncle, after trying for two or three hours, just kind of concluded, we need to do a lot of praying about this. The wife of one of these men, who was herself a leading stirrer of this contention, said, Elder Holder, why don't you pray? You know what my uncle did? They said he fell to his knees like he had been hit with a lightning bolt. And they said they never in their life heard a man pray like he prayed. That's what this kind of lifestyle calls on us to do. Continue in prayer. And watch in the same. I, I, I've been taken aback recently at the number of times in the New Testament praying and watching are in the same context. What do you mean praying and watching? The word watch here is translated from a Greek word which identifies a sentinel or a military guard who is to be awake during the night and stand guard and stay awake to watch for danger or adversaries. What do you, first of all, don't go to sleep when you pray. Don't take prayer for granted when you pray. And please don't talk to the Lord and memorize prayers that he's heard a hundred times. Talk to him from your heart. Tell him what's really in your heart and ask for his help. And in the whole context of what we're talking about here, watch, watch for answers. Watch when you pray for something, watch to see if he fulfills <clears throat> the request you made of him. You could go to sleep and he could fulfill your petition and you wouldn't even notice it. But if you're watchful, you pray expecting an answer. And when the answer comes, you're watchful to see it and recognize it and thank him for it, which is the next point Paul makes. With thanksgiving. And again, this is linked over and over in the New Testament to prayer. Praying with thanksgiving. Make your, offer your supplications with thanksgiving have you thanked the lord for blessings you've actually received for answered prayers you have received recently have you thanked him for deliverance through the last year you're here today demonstrating that you have been spared through the last year have you thanked him for that i love an expression you often use in your prayers you watched over me last night you kept me safe when I was sound asleep, and you woke me up to a bright sunshine this morning. Amen. There's reason to thank God for things like that that we take for granted. Thanksgiving is the mirror opposite to complaining. <laughs> the people complained to God. <laughs> Elijah tried it, didn't he? Lord, they dug down your altars they've killed your prophets and i'm the i'm your only man left lord i'm your only hope <laughs> how the lord respond he didn't respond so well he didn't agree with the prophet and further paul in these words in verse three with all praying also for us that god would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of christ for which i'm also in bonds that i may make it manifest as i ought to speak pray for god to open doors i, I think every biblical conservative christian church and gathering of people not just our folks and our fellowship in today's culture need to be seriously in prayer for the Lord to open doors for the gospel to go where it has not been into individual hearts where it has not been praying for God to open doors you can't open a door we spend too much time trying to pry open doors with people we talk to instead of looking for a door God has opened but when God has opened, pray for yourself, 
pray for your pastor, pray for each other, that any time the Lord opens the door of a person's heart where you work, in your neighborhood, next door, your, your neighbor, or in your extended family, wherever, that if the Lord opens a door, you have the words to speak the mystery of Christ in a, an enticing and encouraging way that says, come and see. And then you pray for the man who preaches when they come and see to preach with power and conviction and clarity so they will be touched and blessed and want to come back. Are we praying? Are <laughs> passive? Paul speaks here, as he does on several occasions, of the mystery of Christ. But it's not the mystery of the Gnostics and, and Gnostic ideas and teachers, first century even today, who say, we have this hidden truth, and we only are going to share it with a select few. And you have to pledge faithfulness to us before you are taught this truth. You don't even know it if you don't pledge your, your secrecy. That's the very mirror opposite to what scripture teaches about Jesus and the gospel. Paul didn't say, pray for me to keep the mystery secret. He said, pray for me to publish it abroad. In the 18th chapter of John's gospel, Jesus, before Pilate, said in secret, I have said nothing I suggest, my friends, that's an excellent model for us as believers today. It may be a tiny little secret, like I see a frown on your face, and I say, are you okay? Is, any, is something bothering you? And pastors so often get the, oh, no, nothing's bothering me. He saw it. He knows. Or it may be some deep, dark secret that would be much better dealt with in your life, published and shared with the request and need for prayer than kept in secret. But when you're talking about the good news of the gospel, shout it from the rooftop. Don't keep it secret. The next point Paul makes in verse five, walk in wisdom toward them that are without redeeming the time. Wisdom is one of those unique qualities of biblical behavior that ask most believers, give me a Bible definition for wisdom and they just stare blankly at you. It's wise moral skill from scripture for your life and your life's activities. One, one uh, New Testament dictionary identified it as godly skill in the affairs of life. I just about quoted him, didn't I? Sound judgment, good common sense. It's called common sense because it's so uncommon. There's something, and, and Paul adds the point then, toward them that are without. <clears throat> we focus a lot of our conduct, especially our polished go to church on Sunday conduct toward those that are within. What influence does your and my lifestyle have on people without? Does it encourage people to inquire and learn more about the faith? Or does it turn them off to the faith and to Jesus? That's the point Paul's making, isn't it? Walk in wisdom toward them that are without. Redeeming the time. There's a cliche, time is money. How do you plan to spend it? That's so true, very true. I think we need to take this point further. The wise man, Solomon himself, in Ecclesiastes in the third chapter, beginning in the first verse and going through most of the chapter, starts off 
to everything there is a time and a purpose to every season under heaven. Wisdom, what this verse is talking about, in great part discerns and understands the seasonality of all of the things Solomon named. I've known of more than one preacher who got himself in a lot of hot water because he didn't respect the season of his time in the pulpit. And so he said something out of season and out of place, trying to be cute, trying to be funny. I heard about a, for example, it was a meeting in the Midwest and, you know, big meeting, a lot of preachers. And a preacher had had great preaching liberty and the man had a touch of humor in his personality. So just by the very nature of the way he preached, he got a few chuckles from people making good Bible points. I've been there. I've heard that with people preaching myself. And I've been one of those who laughed. Well, the next man getting up felt overwhelmed by the power of the sermon he had heard. When you feel that way, it's best to say, let's close the meeting right now and, and enjoy the, the treasure of the moment instead of getting up and trying to fill the time. Pulpit time is not a right. It's a privilege and an obligation. So this man gets up and he's trying to put together Moses and the Israelites at the Red Sea and trying to be cute. He said, they were sure in a mel of a house, weren't they? His church called him up on charges and he had to get on his knees and apologize. <laughs> he was out of season. You, you understand. Would it be appropriate to tell a silly joke at a funeral when people are hurting and looking for comfort? And yet people who don't respect the wisdom of scripture will often try to be out of season in a way that calls attention to themselves instead of respecting the season. And as Paul says in another verse, let everything be done unto edification. If it's not done to edification, why'd you do it anyway, right? We ought to memorize Ecclesiastes 3. Powerful, powerful. Now verse 6, the third thing Paul deals with in our study passage. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. As Paul has done many times in Philippians and in Colossians, the verse begins with a three-letter word, let. Who's in charge of what comes out of your mouth? Right? Yeah. If you don't control what comes out of your mouth, it's, not, it's going to be uncontrolled. You're in charge of what comes out of your mouth. And yes, we've all had those moments when we blurt out something and we'd love to just, with our wide open mouth, reach out and grab it and pull it back. But you can't do that, can you? Once it's out there, it's gone. It's out. Let your speech be all way with grace. You don't have to be mystical to define biblical grace. It's graciousness. It's kindness. It's, it's tenderness. And we of all people champion the fact that we believe in salvation by the grace of God. Do you realize we can conduct ourselves and especially our tongue in a way that absolutely convinces people who, who are around us that we don't believe in grace at all? If it's not spoken in grace, Why'd you say it in the first place? 
Why say it unless you can say it with grace? Prove by the, the spirit of what you say that you have grace, you care with grace for the people who hear you speak. And he didn't say just on rare occasion when you want to. He said, let this always be the case. Is that challenging? <laughs> Would anyone want to have a show of hands about I've spent the last week and I haven't one time spoken a word that was without grace? No, not me. <laughs> How about you? And if you want to raise your hand and say, I spent the last week and I didn't say a single thing that didn't have grace all over it. I'm glad we're all in the same boat here, right? Now let's, let's improve the boat. Seasoned with salt. Jesus said to the disciples in the Sermon on the Mount, you're the salt of the earth. The salt have lost his savor. It's wherewith no more worthy to be salted. It's put in a junk heap and discarded. First century, 21st century, salt has two primary purposes. It's related to food, okay? If our speech is to be seasoned with salt. Doesn't that suggest that we should use our speech as we would use food to another person? Do we want to serve up a dish of food to a brother or a sister in Christ that has been left out of the refrigerator for a week and is spoiled and will give them tomain poisoning or a sick stomach? Or do we want to serve them healthy, nutritious food, tasty food? One of the uses of salt is for taste enhancement. Sandra and I both do some cooking. There are certain dishes that I will do if we have them, and there are certain dishes she will do. And if, if husband and wife and any of you or both have kitchen duty, I can promise you this conversation goes on. Did you add enough salt? You added too much salt. <laughs> you don't need to, to take the, the container of salt that big and turn it upside down. That doesn't enhance flavor, that destroys the dish. You season the dish with salt to flavor enhance it. Let your speech be flavor enhanced with salt, with grace. When we speak to other people, what's the effect our speech has on them? That's the food quality, isn't it? Does my speech, when I speak to, to you, have a nutritious, encouraging outcome? Does it encourage you to be a better believer? Does it encourage you to be more loving and more faithful than you have been? That's the salt quality. And that's, before I say a word, I should consider that point. Will what I'm thinking of saying to this person be an encouragement, spiritual nutrition for the soul. If not, maybe I'd be better advised not to say it. The other use of salt is it's a preservative. When I talk with you, does my conversation with you encourage you to persevere in your faith? to be strong and faithful and to keep on keeping on and not to be discouraged and throw in the towel and give up. What does my speech encourage you to do? I should be preserved, it shouldn't be. In all of this, Paul 
urges wisdom. premier passage, and I want to wrap my thoughts up in this passage this morning, on true biblical wisdom in the trenches, you'll find in James chapter 3. James 3, beginning with verse 13 and going to the end of the chapter. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? We have any, anyone want to volunteer that they're a wise man? <clears throat> Let him show out of a good conversation, not just words, complete lifestyle, including conversation or speech, good conversation, his works with meekness of wisdom. You want to? You say you're wise, prove it 24-7. But if you have, now here's wisdom. What's the opposite of wisdom? It, James will identify it as well. If ye have bitter envying, contention and tension from one person to another, anything that erodes harmony, and encouragement and closeness. There's a quality in envying of competition. My dog's better than your dog. My car is better than your car. My Christianity is better than yours. If you think in that way, you've lost biblical wisdom. <laughs> it's gone. It's the opposite that's, that's ruling. If you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not. There's nothing to be proud of with that attitude. And lie not against the truth. You're contradicting the very grace you say you believe in if you live in that attitude. This wisdom, the bitter envy and strife, descendeth not from above, it ascends from below, <laughs> is earthly, sensual, devilish. I, I heard a story, my, in fact, uh, you know, in the two, three, two generations back, well, one, because I was born when my parents were in their 40s, early 40s. My dad actually attended a debate, but in those, in that time, many Bible-believing or Bible-oriented Christian groups encouraged debates between denominations. It was a common thing. I'm not sure it was a wise thing, and I'm not sure it accomplished a lot, but they had them. <laughs> Elder C.H. Casey was a well-known primitive Baptist preacher from the deep south. He spent most of his ministry. He started in Tennessee and spent most of his ministry in Thornton, Arkansas. He traveled widely, preached widely, and debated widely. Well, in 1832, the Baptists in America divided over gospel means and salvation by grace or works. And so Elder Casey was debating a preacher who believed in the other viewpoint of the 1832 separation. And the subject of the separation, we were once all one body of Baptists and, and we're now divided. What's going on with this? And of course, Elder Casey's point was primitive Baptists are still teaching what Baptists taught before 1832, you're teaching what they taught after 1832. Elder Casey, to make his point, had a, a like a chalkboard behind him, and he drew a log on the chalkboard, and then he put a wedge, drew a wedge in the log on the bottom side of the log and was talking about 1832 and the separation. The other fellow 
got up in his speech and ridiculed Casey. Everyone knows what a logger knows. If you're gonna split a log, you put the wedge on the top so you can hit it with a hammer. Casey never got caught sleeping. <laughs> he came back in his next speech and said, sir, I put the wedge where it belonged. That split came from the pits of hell. <laughs> Well, I don't know how much he accomplished by the contention, but he made his point. We don't make points with contention. The wisdom that comes from the bottom side doesn't produce any benefit in the house of God. <clears throat> For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But he's going to close on a good point. Wonderful. The wisdom that is from above. You want to demonstrate above God-given wisdom in your life. Start working on these attitudes and habits. Simple, isn't it? God never leaves us in the dark. The wisdom that is from above is first pure. It's not double-minded. It's not deceitful. It's not underhanded. Then it's peaceable. It doesn't try to declare war. It looks for reasons for peace. Like my uncle, who in a contentious moment dropped to his knees and prayed for the Lord's help. Gentle and easy to be entreated. Full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Look at the results of a person's life. Does it encourage peace? Does his circle of friends, close, intimate, admiring, respecting friends grow or over time diminish? Does joy and harmony and, and respect and love follow him? Or is there always a little ragged edge? He's telling you by his fruits, whether he's following that wisdom or that wisdom above or below. What will you follow today? Which wisdom will be your trademark when you've said your last word and you're up here in a nicely lined decorated box and somebody else has to say the word about you what will that person say about your lifestyle you, you see we preach our funeral while we're alive we really do what what funeral message are you preaching today pure peaceable gentle easy to be entreated full of mercy and good fruits. I won't even go back over that other list. It's too odious to be reminded. Let's preach a good funeral for ourselves by a lifestyle that continues in prayer, walks in wisdom, and avoids speaking other than with grace. God bless.